Hi, and welcome to Best in Tesla. So, researchers agree the world can be run on 100% renewable energy system by or before 2050. Research from Lod University and 14 additional leading international universities suggest that the new system would be based on largely solar and wind energy, energy storage, sector coupling, and direct and indirect electrification of almost all energy demand. But let's dive a little more into this, because today I have the pleasure of having two people who were actually involved in these studies. Professor Christian Breyer from Lott University in Finland and Yannick Haas, a senior lecturer in sustainable systems at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. So this is going to be very interesting. So let's check it all out and let's dive right in. So, Christian, I talked about this um, study that Lot University has done over a month ago now in my new show. Uh, and you have actually been part of this study. Uh, what was your uh, part of this, uh, this study that Lot University had done? Yeah, first of all, uh, the study is a kind of a common research perspective of quite many uh, researchers in the 100% renewable energy community. So there are uh, the five leading teams are represented on the paper. Leading means having most articles published in the field or getting most citations. And then various topical experts on specific topics, whether it's social science aspects, whether it's uh, stability on maybe even on the second scale of a highly renewable energy system energetic uh, sustainability uh, raw material supply so all various aspects um, are represented and my role was to coordinate all that and of course bring the full uh, perspective of my team into the paper and various of my uh, team members in my team are also represented and in the end uh, the idea was to really start from the beginning when 100% renewable energy research started, uh, which had been in the 1970s, to bring really the perspective up to today and then a kind of view what are the next topics to be tackled in the, in the years to come. Okay, cool. And uh, Yanni, you have been, you said you were indirect uh, part of this study. What, what, uh, what have you done in this study? Yes, yeah, so we, with Christian, we have worked together on different publications in the past. <laughs> um, for example, we did a couple of scenarios for Chile. Chile for us is always a good uh, country to model because it's isolated. So it's a nice toy system to try out things. <laughs> yeah, and the, the other study that I found or I think could be interesting for the audience is one where we compared cost projections for energy technologies that we do in the energy community and are more often than we want um, surprised by being too conservative. And you see the same phenomena in EV adoption, right? That's very familiar to your audience that yeah. apparently catches it by, by surprise. Like there are EVs now and Tesla is winning and <laughs> no one said it, thought it's coming. <laughs> yeah. We have the same issue now in electric systems where solar photovoltaics is not only the cheapest among options, it's the cheapest in human history. And that yeah. has been called so by the International Energy Agency. And when they say it, they're normally a bit more tilted towards fossil fuels, right? So when they say that, that means something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I was yeah. a part of that study where we compared cost projections done by different energy studies and compared those projections to actual costs that then happened. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah, because we have talked a lot about this adoption of EVs here on, on this channel and, and how wrong agencies that is actually planning and politi uh, politicians are listening to is very, very wrong in their predictions. Um, and I know Tony Seba, if you know him, that has uh, Rethink, has also made this whole uh, lecture about um, this energy bubble he thinks we are in because their calculations, um, what he said, um, the levelized cost of electricity, the LCOE um, of a system, is also projected very, very wrong into the future. Um, and it seems like the same thing is happening with the uh, renewable energy. But 
you say that uh, 100% renewable energy is feasible, but why do you think that they get this so wrong when it comes to, to renewable energy? What is it they are they are getting wrong? Is it the data that are wrong that they are using? And what kind of data are they using if they're not looking at the real world data? Well, that's a tough question. And with many possible answers, maybe Christian takes the first hit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, different drivers or reasons why such projections can be wrong. I would say the fundamental reason for wrong projection is wrong mindset and wrong belief system. And because if uh, in, in, in the end, we're always talking on scenarios to project something into the future because no one can predict the future. You can have a forecast maybe for the next five years uh, where you start from solid grounds from today. And typically also that is awful wrong. Just go two years back and do a projection of inflation and Russian war in Ukraine and others. So all this has an influence. And maybe two years ago, this was not as not yet on the radar screen, but having a more long-term perspective requires scenarios. And for scenarios, typically, again, we 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 we, we take into account the the trends and the fundamental opportunities of technologies, societal requirements, just take climate change. So more fossil fuel use is simply not an option due to climate change. And of course, then the fast development of technologies and how fast those can be taken up in society. So this is just the framing. And then is the question what we do from that. And now let's start with International Energy Agency. They have this, how to say, holy book called World Energy Outlook published in October, November every year. So now again soon to be published. Um, and they have, after many years of discussion, now acknowledged that uh, solar photovoltaics is the least cost source of energy in history of mankind. So that is now achieved, but you don't find that in the scenarios. So that's, that's uh, a bit irritating. And that means the highest installation per year in the decades to come is 600 gigawatts of solar PV. Now we have to uh, bring that into shape. What means 600 gigawatts? Uh, this year we will have most likely 250 gigawatts uh, installed in the world. Um, the silicon manufacturing capacity are currently ramped to 900, more than 900 gigawatts mid of this decade. So this was just a few weeks ago um, announced, uh, this insight by Bloomberg. Uh, however, in the decades to come, uh, International Energy Agency do not assume that more than 600 gigawatt a year would be possible while leading researchers in the field, whether it's in the field of solar energy or in the field of energy system modeling, uh, rather come to the conclusion it might be up to 3,000 gigawatts a year, which is required in the 2030s. So there is a factor of five in between, uh, which is not on the radar screen. And this is, of course, a problem. We are not talking on someone has 10, 20% too high or too low numbers. This is something we could always debate or discuss. But factor five uh, reveals a fundamental disconnect. And the fundamental disconnect is largely the belief system because you find very high numbers of nuclear power uh, in the projection of the IEA. Uh, but the question is who should pay for an affordable technology because in the same report of the IEA, yeah. yeah yeah sure ex exactly in the, in, the, in the same report of the IEA you can find uh, there is no other option to generate electricity for higher cost and then in the report we further find that fossil carbon capture and storage should still play a relevant role but it still leads to air pollution. It still requires high cost fossil fuels and no one knows exactly how to store the CO2 underground or who should be responsible, what are laws if something leaks and and so on. So uh, this is all a bit disturbing, but this is IA. Maybe we come then in a, in a follow up question to other major international organizations, which will be the IPCC, which does also not yet play a really convincing role um 
in that field, but maybe the perception is the fundamental issue. The cost is not anymore uh, the fundamental reason. This is after 10 years of low cost solar, more or less understood that it is low cost. Um, the models also play a role, but maybe we come in the follow up question to that because you, you need to have your energy system model optimized that low cost electricity can find its way to all kinds of application, which might be then industry, which is the transport sector, direct, indirect. So indirect means e-fuels, um, direct means direct uh, electricity use for electric vehicles, of course, uh, but also in heat applications. And for that models have to be prepared. So if that's missing, then such electricity based solutions are also missing. And if electricity based solutions are missing, then low cost solutions are missing and typically uptake of solar electricity and wind power is missing. Yeah. Yeah, well, five times in difference is, is that's, that's going to make a big difference, right? difference in 10, 20 years. Uh, oh, yeah. So, and, and, but, the, but the cost that is, is now, you know, say, everybody believes that the cost is, it is the cheapest way of making electricity. There's no longer any skepticism about that or? Maybe Yannick, you first, then I can catch up again. <laughs> yeah, and maybe just to compliment a bit on the previous answer, and that is, I think we are human are very bad in understanding exponential growth. <laughs> the other day, I I went to a talk also in energy systems, and it had a had a very catchy title: "Are we smarter than bacteria?" <laughs> and the talk title to to conclude that we are smarter. So it started off with a very typical example of using bacteria as an example for exponential growth, right? Say they live in a petri um, dish and they double every minute. And if I tell you the petri dish, something like this is for my cat, <laughs> is full at 12, uh, when is it half full? And the answer is easy. It's one minute to 12 because it doubles every minute, right? <laughs> okay, so we got that. But if I dig down that uh, road and, and ask you, what about 1%? When, when we have 1% of the petri dish filled, that's, that's seven minutes to 12, right? Wow. And what about a quarter to 12? That's one in 30,000, <laughs> right? Yeah. The, bacteria, the bacteria don't know that. They grow, they reproduce, and <laughs> at some point they run out of resources. And... After feeling that in energy systems and now surfing back in energy system planning, we have the same issue. We try to project um, into the future what's going to happen. And we are living a revolution in the energy system. The numbers that Christian mentioned, even the more conservative 600 gigawatts of solar per year, right? Uh, that, that's a lot of capacity in terms, if you think back in history and how much we used to install a given technology, and now we're just changing everything. We're changing the whole electric system. We, we're electrifying heat. We're electrifying transport. Uh, big changes happening very quickly and what we found and it's maybe anecdotic evidence is that if we're too positive on our cost assumptions and too aggressive maybe in what we see in our studies not too many people believe it um, i'm not sure if you have evidence that christian in your processes but it's like yeah this is way too low no <laughs> so again and then i circle back to the other study that i mentioned we, we proved that yes most of us in the energy community are often too conservative and um, that, that the many other reasons involved but my, my short answer is yeah <laughs> we don't understand exponential growth yeah mm -hmm. But it's, it, it's even worse that most growth processes are uh, logistic growth. So this makes it even more complicated for people mm -hmm. to anticipate and unfortunately even for modelers. Logistic growth means it's exponential growth in the first phase of the growth. Then for a specific... Right time it's a linear growth when we are in the center so maybe if a third of the growth is done to maybe two-thirds there is more or less linear growth so every year is a bit similar uh, in, in the growth and for the last third it's a kind it goes into a saturation it's, it's it flattens out and the growth rates uh, go down this is what we typically observe and that we observe very often, by the way, also in, in natural systems. So that might be very special bacteria, but very often in natural systems, we also see the logistic growth. This is, by the way, also the population growth in the world. Currently, we are already towards the flattening part. Uh, and the reason is when we get rich and rich means uh, 5,000 to 10,000 
uh, rather $5,000 uh, gross domestic product per capita, then kids per woman go down. And kids per woman go down means we're then around two and less than two kids per woman. And this automatically means that population stabilizes. Why this is so important? When population stabilizes, then standards of living still may grow for decades and life expectancy may also grow. But the fundamental driver of energy demand in the world is first of all population growth and then standards of living. So it's a factor of both. Why this is so important? Uh, with standards of living, we have all our uh, um, energy service demand more or less defined because this is a, a, a consequence of standards of living. And this drives our overall energy demand. And when it comes to the energy demand, is the question what types of energy we use when it comes uh, then to CO2 emissions uh, related to climate change. Uh, so the fundamental driver, and this is the so-called iPad uh, identity or Kaya identity. Uh, this is maybe the most fundamental equation when it comes to climate change. Uh, this, and, and it's rather a simple equation in the end, but very complicated to understand. Uh, that means the CO2 emissions is a factor of what types of energy we use. It's a factor on the standards of living. And in the very end, it's driven by people in the world. And due to that, this is important, but all this is uh, in particular uh, logistic growth and there many are not that good, but then it's also the anticipation. So in the end, people always knew, I, I very often quote uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, when he was asked how this revolution in India uh, was possible, then he thought uh, in the beginning, they laughed at us, then they ignored us, then they uh, they fought us, and in the end, we win. Yeah. And everyone knew that it cannot be different. And I think we're currently in phase three with renewables. Uh, there is a strong opposition uh, from vested interests. This is unfortunately a major problem. And for example, International Energy Agency is not that complicated to be explained. It's an international governmental organization. So it's driven by the energy ministers in the world. And they are typically under heavy lobbying pressure of the international oil companies. Uh, so they end energy business is a conservative business and yet to that it takes long that 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 the market trends are taken up but coming back to to solar pv uh yannick mentioned that uh that it takes long that you have a one percent contribution of a new technology this happened a few years ago with solar pv but it may take decades that the new technology in a huge market, global electricity market is a huge market, takes 1%, but maybe it takes only a few years to get it then to 10%, uh, given exponential growth. And if you see uh, the historic growth pattern of solar electricity, then at least for the last seven decades, uh, not a single technology ever had such a high growth. And the reason is it's available everywhere, there is everywhere sunshine. There is not a single spot on planet where we would like sunshine. And if someone has such a spot in mind, please let me know. Then I explain you when in the year there will be a lot of sunshine. <laughs> Even uh, on the German balconies, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. So I personally live in Finland. Uh, we should not talk about sunshine in the winter half year. But in the summer half year, you have solar systems in Finland. They run 24-7. Uh, of course, the sun does not disappear. There we talk then on midnight sun and these kind of quite nice effects. Uh, but but the, the point is, so accessibility, uh, uh, solar energy is available everywhere in the world, in particular in the Sun Belt, where two thirds of world population are living. So plus minus 30 degree north south around the equator. Uh, and then it's an easy to, uh, to, 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 to apply technology. Uh, it's low cost and it's fully modular. So what Yannick just mentioned, you can have a balcony system. You have two modules fixed on your balcony or you have one module on put on the top of your uh, hut when you're somewhere uh, fully remote. Or you can have a two gigawatt photovoltaic power plant. 
as it's also built. So and everything is modular in between. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's it's uh, it's 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 fully modular, and that makes it so valuable. And of course, it delivers the most valuable form of energy, which is electricity. However, it requires an environment. So we better should have a kind of a power grid around. We better should have some some uptaking batteries. They can be in cars. They can be stationary, but batteries are very helpful. Uh, and in the next step, we better have a lot of electrolyzers for all what we cannot directly electrify. Uh, we have to convert the electrons into molecules that starts with hydrogen, but not many are really interested in hydrogen. People are interested in ammonia and methanol and jet fuel uh, and a few hydrogen, uh, 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 a part of hydrogen. And this is then for the hard to abate sectors where direct electrification will not work. And then we have the inner core of such a system. So it's, it's solar, it's batteries, it's a grid environment, it's electrolyzers. And of course, when there is excellent wind conditions, then we have some wind power. Uh, if there is well established hydropower already available then of course hydropower we may have some geothermal energy in particular for those living on a volcano it makes a lot of sense um <laughs> like in new zealand uh so when there are no when there are edges of tectonic plates uh then there uh, is geothermal energy available due to the thin crust of the earth um and there might be ocean energy, so excellent wave power conditions might be harvested in the years to come. So we have different sources, but in the end, it will be largely solar energy and in in windy regions, wind power, and then the rest to complement that. Yeah. So the, the study, you say that the 100% renewable energy can be done, and it's proven now by science. So if we should say... Here you go. Here's the proof. What do you tell the, the skeptic people about this? What is the proof that you have uh, found? Or how, how have you proven that it is 100% uh, possible? Yeah, this has different levels, I would say. So you can do that in studies in anticipating that you take best state-of-the-art energy system models. First of all, that you can describe as realistically as possible an energy system. So this is a model. It's not reality, but it tries to, to be close to reality, at least with its core features. Then you have to show that the, the financial assumptions are from this world so they are matching the reality and cost trends and projections to the future then you have to show that you do not uh, underestimate or not overestimate the available potential so the renewable energy potential you have to show what how demand patterns may develop and what is then most important when it comes to very high shares of renewables up to 100 percent renewables that such studies are done in an hourly resolution because then it can better reflect or fully reflect um the variability of the solar and wind resource, also the variability of the demand. Um, so this is important. And then, of course, what helps to have really scientific publication, because that means that a lot of peers check it. So it has to be written in good scientific standards. Typically, not single authors do that, but teams of authors. So that already helps to get it improved. Then it's submitted to, to well-established good scientific journals where editors check it, reviewers check it. It's typically one or two rounds of reviews done, and then it's published as a scientific article. A single article is a good indication, but we're talking of hundreds of articles uh, coming to that conclusion. And I would say this is a strong scientific evidence it goes in that direction and then of course we see it in reality in the first countries maybe not yet for the full energy system but on the power sector we have maybe 10 to 15 countries in the world they're already there typically starting with hydropower because there it started more than 100 years ago uh, but we have now countries like in Uruguay practically no one knows they have 100 percent renewable power supply uh, but only half is hydropower and the other half is mainly wind power there is some solar electricity there is some bioenergy so they have a, a mix uh, and they reached it there and they reached it in less than 10 years to get from 50% renewables to 100%. So people say, oh, I may take decades. No, it may take less than a decade if there is real ambition. Sometimes it takes a tweet. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah, exactly. So just to, to add on this, right, um, we are 
maybe lucky to live because we have had many colleagues before us talking about renewables and maybe they retired and never saw a coming reality. Now we're lucky to see massive deployments. And so we have this confluence of the models selling us, yes, it is the cheapest, uh, together with these systems being deployed and not only solar during daytime, because one, one of the big criticisms from naysayers is, yeah, solar during daytime, yeah, well, that's cheap, but what, what about the night, right? So the talk about the grid integration costs, the batteries, right? But now mm -hmm. we have cheap available batteries also, and they work not only in terms of storing and moving the energy around, energy arbitrage, but they're also much quicker in reacting and providing grid stability services, for example. So we saw in Australia a very old system really not behaving nicely, installed a couple of big batteries, and, and, and now all of a sudden you have a well-functioning grid. So, so we have that confluence between the models are there, the prices are there, they're being deployed. We see in practice that this is working. Sometimes bigger countries like Uruguay, sometimes small islands and islands, one thinks they're easy to handle because they're small, so, so it's easy to build out. But, but since they're so small, like the sun always, right? <laughs> if you have a cloud, the sun goes away on a whole island. So from a technical point of view, they're more complicated. And we have many islands that are fully renewable by now, and that should lead the way. That's a demonstration in practice <laughs> that shows us from a technical point of view that's feasible. And then from an economic point of view, I think there's enough trust in, in the studies, the, the energy system models that we have. And the underlying assumptions are based on learning curves, right? And learning curves is something we have known for 100 years, I think, uh, from the Wrights brothers, the same from, from the airplanes, right? <laughs> so every yeah. time we have a cumulative doubling, we have a fixed decrease in cost. And we trust that. We have seen that work for washing machines, for batteries, for electric cars, and for solar photovoltaic. Yeah. So there's not really new technology needed for us to get to 100% renewable. Can we do it with the technology we have today? Yeah, um, if I take it, <laughs> yes, we can. Solar photovoltaics is there, <laughs> better and cheaper than ever. Uh, the records we see go in those lines. It's cheaper now than, than, than yesterday, and <laughs> it's even more efficient. And then the balance of system get better, right? Like all the other components that we need. Uh, and as Christian mentioned, it's a, a lot of solar, a lot, a real lot of solar, <laughs> coupled with batteries and batteries. Uh, and you know that in your audience, right, Lars, that batteries are there. We have big stationary batteries also by Tesla, for example, since this is what the channel is about, right? Um, the mega packs, and we have batteries in smaller systems like in, in cars. Uh, so that technology is there. It's maybe a, a question of how quick we can deploy them. And maybe in the next couple of years, we see some bottlenecks in some critical materials. Christian has some papers on that. For example, lithium, very abundant, but in terms of the refining, right, there are production bottlenecks that need to be solved. So maybe there's a scheduling issue between what do I do with the lithium first? Do I put it in electric cars and then in big batteries and small batteries and can, maybe that's an important thing for the next couple of years, um, can and should electric cars interact with, with the grid, right? Vehicle to grid. So can can you provide that stability? Uh, bigger systems do that, um, like power walls, right? Um, but, but hey, inside of a car, I have 50 kilowatt hours, 80 kilowatt hours. That, that's, a, that's a pretty big battery. <laughs> yeah. And also we see like, like examples of school buses that is... Uh very big batteries but they only uh, do doing work two hours a day or something like that and then they just sit there they could be really big uh, energy storage and be a big part of the the local grid in that area yeah exactly. what we what we have learned in studies is that the most important is smart charging so that uh, the vehicles are charged when electricity is available and maybe for the buses school buses you mentioned um it's it makes a lot of sense to charge them when electricity is abundantly or in very high shares in the grid available it could be in the night hours with wind energy uh, with wind power uh it could be during daytime uh with solar electricity and of course we know practically the cars or practically all cars on average uh, to 98 percent of the time they are not in operation uh, so they, they they don't move, so there is a huge capacity for that. Uh, we we do studies with smart EV charging 
and vehicle to grid and vehicle to grid i would say is even a bit more over uh, estimated than smart ev charging this cause this this very flexible demand response this is the most important uh however then doing some discharging in 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 hours of of, of the highest need uh, that will be valuable because we know from from cars of course it depends on the individual uh, use profile but maybe uh, charging once a week is enough because on average uh, people have maybe 40 kilometers a year uh, sorry a day mm -hmm. uh, average mileage De of course depending on commuting distances and other activities but this is a kind of a statistical mean value and if the range in in battery electric vehicles is nowadays often 400 500 kilometers uh, then it means uh, less less than than a week charging or of, of or more more than a week charging time from one full charge to the next full charge will be sufficient of course we can have partly charging in between but uh, that means if maybe 20 percent of the battery would be available in times when it's not really needed of course that needs to be fully controllable uh by 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 the users of the car but uh, if 20% will be available just for for frequency containment uh, uh, regulation or or for discharging in peak hours, uh, then it will be very valuable uh, for the system. But maybe the smart EV charging is is the more valuable, and this is just one feature of dozens of features. So the the question was, do we have all technologies available? This is a good example. In principle, yes. But it has to be how to how to say further improved. We have to find better business models. We have to find, in particular, from a behavioral point of view, uh, from a, from a use point of view, what people really like, what they really need. And of course, no one want to give a free lunch. So if you opt for this flexibility with your car, what is your personal benefit? Do you get it for less electricity prices? Do you get an income? So we had very early studies uh, where vehicle to grid was just investigated whether technically it would work. And this was done in various countries in the world, in particular in various European countries. One of the first country was Denmark, where we have a very high uh, wind share in, in, in the system. And due to that, uh, some, some variability. And there, the electric vehicles uh, with vehicle to grid could earn 1,000 euros a year for the car owner. And then is the question, is 1,000 euros a year a nice income? Yes or no? People have to have to dis decide that and clarify that for themselves. But I think if it doesn't limit uh, the, the, the convenience, how this product, this car is used, then 1,000 euros a year is nice. Yeah, yeah definitely. Exactly. And going on with the other technologies that we need, we said a lot of solar, we need batteries. And then, uh, as Christian mentioned, right, we need wind uh, in windy regions. We know how to win do wind turbines since like a couple of hundreds of years <laughs> and electrical ones <laughs> since the last 50 years. Um, and then maybe you're lucky enough to have hydropower and you're lucky enough to have geothermal, right? And maybe the, the newest component, um, again, exclamation, um, um, and film session mentions. <laughs> um, the, maybe the news component is the electrolyzer um, in terms of deployment, um, but for, for making power to X and all the synthetics that we need, jet fuel. Um, and that is just on the beginning of the learning curve in terms of cost. So we hope for a lot of cost decrease to come from there too. Uh, but, but the other, I'm not sure if I can put a number and 99% of the system or, or whatever, but the big component of the energy transition is with technology that we have and then controls getting more intelligent and <laughs> easy maybe. <laughs> maybe on the technology, what we have or what we need. Uh, so there is this fundamental rule in responsible energy system modeling that you do not assume technologies which are on a so-called technology readiness level below five or six. So level five or six means you have at least larger scale um, technology demonstrators to show that the technology itself works. Okay. And if you know that the technology works, maybe still in some environment, but we're not anymore talking on fundamental physical effects on lab scale. So we're talking on applied technology on a larger scale and we go outside to a real environment where it's really used uh, to showcase it works. And then it's just a question, it can be 
uh, than applied more more convenient that it's maybe more robust maybe the lifetimes get longer and in particular with industrial scaling and economies of scale we get cost down uh, so this is then a kind of a next step but very often technology start in niches and uh, this niche technology is quite interesting so in, in in the decades to come we need huge facilities for co2 direct air capture and why 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 we need that we have two waves how we uh, need that the first is for so-called uh, co2 direct air capture and then carbon utilization because we need a sustainable raw material source for hydrocarbons we still need the hydrocarbons we still need is for chemical industry which i think on plastics uh, but also kerosene jet fuel for aviation and most likely also methanol for long distance marine so uh, uh, applications such as think a ship from Shanghai to Los Angeles uh, something like that uh, there we need a fuel and for that we need a sustainable carbon raw material supply because fossil sources will 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 disappear hopefully in the near future but then we need such a raw material and that can be done with co2 direct air capture and in the second wave we will need the same technology to go for net negative emissions due to the not used last 20 years for a successful energy transition uh, we cannot avoid any more negative emissions to reach a 1.5 degree Celsius target. Um, and due to that, we have to go for massive net negative emissions. And it seems to be that CO2 direct air capture is the best option for that. But now going back to the roots of this technology, we are now in the third decade of the 21st century. But this technology was introduced in the 1960s and it was introduced there for uh, nuclear submarines and for space uh, stations in outer space because if people are in a fully how to say captured environment uh, then co2 would accumulate in our air and then finally humans could not survive and due to that a cleaning technology for co2 in the air had to be developed for this specific uh, environment and now this was the first niches so technology obviously has proven it works well because people can survive on space stations they can survive on such submarines uh, for weeks uh, so this this is absolutely clear and now we go for scaling for larger capacities large volume uh, getting the cost down but this is the key element in such energy system modeling we only assume technologies which are available which have been demonstrated and then it's a question of engineering to get them rolled out on the larger scale but this is then typically not anymore that challenging compared to the fact we have to harvest the physical effect and get a technical application out of that that may take decades uh, and, and 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 just with, with solar photovoltaics we use this technology since the 1900 let's say late 50s early 60s because there it conquered uh, electricity power supply of satellites in outer space that was the first niche where solar electricity was dominating and now several other fields came on top of that uh, but uh, decades before Albert Einstein got the Nobel Prize for uh, for finding, discovering uh, this physical effect. So that can take very long from, 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 from finding a new physical effect uh, to, to, to have a first applicable solution. And if this first solution is available, it may still take a long time to get it into the mass markets. But this is then a question of growth and, 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 and interests. And, and, and societal needs. So that can be pushed. Just a good example in solar electricity photovoltaics. Uh, just 10, 15 years ago, it took 20 to 30 years to get new developments of the lab into the markets. Nowadays, this is a question of a few years. So in less than five years, new lab developments are available in huge volumes in the market. So this accelerates. Why this accelerates? We have now a very large industry with, 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 with very high technical absorption capacities, many thousands, tens of thousands of engineers doing this transfer job, and then it can be fast. So this is all a yeah. question and, and uh, a signal of, of maturity, but for this energy system modeling, the key question is, is it an already existing demonstrated technology? And then it can be implemented because then we saw in reality that it will happen. And 
due to the societal needs and of course attractiveness also from business cases yeah um, just to touch on that, uh, I find this X course in history fascinating, right? Everybody has Einstein in his mind like this funny dude with a, with a crazy hair <laughs> talking about relativity. But in the end, the Nobel for the photoelectric effect is what allows us to have cheap photovoltaics today and it's saving the day, right? <laughs> and, and then again, um, in terms of space applications, the first applications for solar photovoltaics on satellites, right? And then what Christian mentioned on the C2 for cleaning the air in, in space stations, apparently it's the space race is again <laughs> responsible <laughs> for saving us, especially if we overshoot, as Christian mentioned, and need to go into carbon negativity with capture. So that's, that's I think, fascinating <laughs> how these byproducts from a space race or from Einstein <laughs> yeah. is more relevant today than ever before yeah yeah there's so many cool technologies um but you also in the study you talk about this uh, sector coupling can you give an example of what that is because i actually don't get what uh what what that means yeah today in the energy system we practically live in silos silos means we have uh at least in the old days a transport sector which is mainly based on oil we have a heating uh, segment where we typically burn fossil fuels, oil or gas, typically. And then we have a power sector where we use different fuels, but we don't use the power sector, uh, the electricity to have substantial amounts of heat or to have really the transport sector run. So this is the old, how to say, not coupled energy system. Uh, however, what currently is created step by step, some countries are faster than others, but uh, that means that step by step by step, the energy system is based on electricity. Why electricity? In a renewable electricity dominated world, this is the least cost source of energy. In a fossil dominated world, it was just putting a pipe into the ground and you get very low cost oil. And then, of course, this was so attractive and this was the dominating uh, source of energy, low cost oil and gas gas and coal, but this is gone. Uh, now we have low cost electricity and then the sector coupling means this electricity goes into the system and then it's, it's, it, 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 it flows in applications for heat. So where we have, for example, heat pumps, where we have a direct heat generation, it goes into the transport sector where we see then smart EV charging with electric vehicles. We see vehicle to grid, so it goes forth and back. Uh, we have electrolyzers. They typically run when there is low cost solar and wind available. If there is a shortage, for hours or for days of solar and wind, then these electrolyzers would go down, maybe even close to zero. You can run them flexibly. And in between, we have a hydrogen buffer storage. So that means those segments uptaking the hydrogen, they can be run on base load. So synthesis for ammonia, methanol, jet fuel, others, uh, they, they, they still run on a base load operation and the low cost, typically underground hydrogen buffer storage, uh, then... Uh, makes this possible, but all these different solutions are coupled. So we have things which or, or parts of energy uptake which before have been not into close contact or in response, they now react to each other. So we have a lot of demand response. Uh, just think again, smart EV charging, uh, take the electrolysis and hopefully very soon also with heat pumps. When we connect heat pumps with uh, thermal energy storage, then again, when there is a lot in winter half year, very often wind is available then the heat pumps can convert it to heat and then this heat can be stored. We have in, in Denmark even heat storage for, for a season. So in the summer there is solar energy collected, stored underground and then used in the winter half year uh, for heat supply. So even on a very long term it's possible but typically heat storage will be for a few days. Um, but all, all this is coupled and interconnected and uh, this is then called the so-called sector coupling. The consequences of that is always make use of low-cost electricity from solar and wind and maybe other complementary sources uh, and reduce uh, storage demand uh, with this uh, very good coordination of the different uh, demands and what is important our energy services demand should be not compromised at all. So whenever we 
as humans, as a society, as companies need a specific energy service demand, it has to be done on time. So we don't lose any kind of convenience, but uh, the smart and uh, solutions are what I call in the metabolism of the energy system. So there the cleverness has to be implemented, but it should be not a lack of service quality for us or for the end users. Yes. Okay. Awesome. So well, the short answer is just it's a technicism to say we have to consider all the different sectors at once, right? And yeah. uh, in order to uh, or in order for um, supply meeting demand, that's that's what we need to have. We have energy and we're going to consume it. Um, if we don't consume it at the same time, um, we don't need as much storage, right? Christian said that very clearly, um, but we need flexibility and the flexibility can be readily available in all these different sectors. Yeah. And you, you, you talked about that the predictions uh, of this has been way off so far and, and seems to be way off in the future as well. But and, and this is an exponential growth. Um, so in your study, you say this could be done by 2050 or before. So so just to end off here, some guesses to, to when do you think we will have 100% renewable uh, energy available? <laughs> Maybe Yannick, you want to start on the case of Chile, and then I uh, roll it <laughs> <Yeah>. out <laughs> further. Uh, let, let me put it this way: it's increasingly evident, right? The day that passes, right, that solar for Chile, for example, Atacama Desert, which Allah's son is the cheapest. So it would be weird not doing it now. <laughs> and we see that even with storage by the year 2025, you need really to go really, really strongly with solar and with a lot of batteries. So, so I have high hopes that in Chile you can do it around the year 2030. Um, the, the world, well, it depends a bit. Huh? Um, mm. Chile maybe has uh, the luck, same as uh, the Nordic countries, of having hydropower, which can already serve as a source of, of storage. It doesn't have pumped hydro, so it, it's not like the ability of charging it and discharging, but discharging it flexibly over time already gives you the, uh, the much needed flexibility to integrate all, all the solar, right? So what you could see the hydropower park doing, for example, is to be steady or, or very low during daytime when you have solar, right? Uh, and at night it, it powers up. So you breathe in, you breathe out, you breathe in, breathe out with day and night. Very easy. <laughs> yeah, maybe to... to... To give examples, within 10 years time, a country can get from 50% renewable energy share close to 100%. Uh, this was show, uh, shown by Uruguay. Uh, when one starts practically on the scratch, it takes a bit longer because the country is not yet prepared for, for, for this technology. Uh, but nowadays it's well developed. Just take the case of Germany within 20 years, uh, 50% and the first 50% was possible. Similar in Denmark, Denmark more wind power, Germany more balanced with wind and solar. Take nowadays California, it's 25% of all electricity is from solar. I go 20 years back, then the number was close to zero. Um, so, and th these are huge economies, so with huge volumes. Uh, however, we have a country like Tokelau, they're in the Pacific. There it was just one larger investment and then the country was practically 100% solar. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's 10,000 people, but they're very remote and it's, it's the least cost solution. So the amortization is a few years because uh, before they had to use very, very high cost fossil fuels in, in a very remote area in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific. Um, so this is a kind of, uh, in 10 years, a lot can happen. Uh, we found in, I would say, more theoretical studies, uh, from a cost point of view, electricity supply for the power sector between 2030 and 2040 is the least cost point globally. So the question is whether we can ramp it that fast, because there is a lot of inertia, now not technical inertia, but social societal inertia to be not that fast. And of course, we need all the people doing that. So someone has to do the work. Someone has to give the permissions. And sometimes it's the bottleneck. Nowadays, I have even the impression you get faster permission for a nuclear power plant than for a wind farm. Uh, at least in Europe, which is completely insane. Uh, so this is a question of rules we set to ourselves, but a wind farm itself can be built, can be erected in a few months. So in six months it's built. 
but if it takes uh, more than 10 times of that time to get the permits then we are simply stupid um so but but of course well, but we're not has... smarter than bacteria that's what i said at the beginning <laughs> exactly unfortunately that's the point yeah, yeah but but this has an influence on, on on how fast we can be but the power sector is still the easiest part because uh, this is direct electrification when it comes to indirect electrification mm -hmm. then more infrastructure has to be prepared uh, more additional efforts have to be taken just take steel making steel making there we need coal to get rid of the ore uh, of the oxygen from the iron ores and then we get uh, the the primary steel which is then prepared uh, for all our steel applications in steel making and this has to be substituted with hydrogen and then we use the hydrogen as a reduction material and then we get um, uh, the, the iron ores converted to, to steel with hydrogen. But this requires a bit more efforts in the industry to switch from coal to hydrogen. And this, of course, has, has, has some inertia and this we, we have uh, across all segments of, of energy uptake. Uh, but to honestly, within 15 to 20 years, job can be done across the entire energy system. The power sector can be faster. But what is really required that we have a kind of a societal vision that we all walk in the same direction. So if a fraction of society walks north, the others walk, walk south and, and from the other half, uh, many walk west and the rest walk east, then in a consequence, nothing happens. So this yeah. is very often the situation. But if we have a common target, go in one direction, then we are very effective and then it can be fast. So mm -hmm. to cut long story short, by 2050, the job can be easily done. Uh, by 2040, it should be possible, but requires much more effort. Uh, if we want to have it even faster, so let's say 2035, then it requires really major efforts. And it might be not impossible, but really at the edge when it comes to the entire energy system. When it comes to cover the roofs with PV, this is a job can be done in five, eight, ten years. This is this is a kind of a societal choice to 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 really have a priority and then go for it. The same is with battery electric vehicles. We have everything on hand, what is required. So if we want to have within, let's say, five years time from now, practically independently where in the world we are, in particular in the developed world, if in five years time from now, 90% of all newly sold vehicles should be battery electric, then it's a societal choice to decide it now and go for it. And we know that the country like Norway, they have now more than 90%, around about 90% of all newly sold vehicle are, are electric vehicles. Uh, and if you can do it in a country like Norway, then tell me all kind of OECD countries where it should not be possible. Then it's just a matter of decision making to go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, excellent answer, Christian. And uh, thanks. You clarified. My answer on Chile was more thinking on the electric sector uh, because they have a lot of solar, right? And it's easy. And plus, they have the ambition of exporting hydrogen. So they can overshoot in the electricity production, right? And then with the electrolyzer, you do the hydrogen. <laughs> but, but maybe on the demand side, in terms of electric vehicle adoption, um, emerging markets are a bit slower, right? They sometimes, like even New Zealand, they import used cars, in our case, from Japan. So Nissan Leafs, like the first generation, is what we see here on the streets as the electrical ones that get the <laughs> federal rebate yeah. and different right to the Tesla that, that you drive. <laughs> um, and maybe that's the, the, the one impediment on how to electrify our demand here in, in other countries. And I'm not sure if, if financing is going to be an issue for Africa, for example. Christian, what do you think? It's, it's quite interesting. So we, we do a lot of research also for Africa, where we have, of course, the, the a really severe constraint on infrastructure and on financing capabilities. Mm -hmm. However, we see it's also the region in the world where energy supply is the highest in cost per unit. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, 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 the incentivation is also strong to switch. And for Africa, practically independently where in Africa we are, um, PV battery is the inner core of any solution. And the reason is uh, that practically the entire continent is around the equator, north or south or at the equator. So the solar resource is very stable over the year. Uh, 
Uh, in some parts of Africa, we have really strong and good winds. So this is in some parts of Sahara Desert. So north of Nigeria, we have excellent wind. Horn of Africa, we have perfect wind. Some parts of South Africa, we have really good wind. Some parts of Algeria, Morocco, really good wind. But all in all, it's a, a solar dominated continent. And this, of course, has also an opportunity because we do not need necessarily huge power grid infrastructure because sun is available everywhere. And with with local demand and, and batteries, we can overcome the day-night challenge. And then it can be a local solution. Just to give you an example how how flexible the, the, the technology is from the residential electricity demand in Yemen, which is a country we would have not on our radar screen when it comes to, to, to latest, most modern technology. But from the residential uh, electricity demand, 50% is solar electricity. And this is the, the second highest share in the world. The highest share is Tokelau. And the second highest is then Yemen. And what is the reason for that? It's so dangerous and so expensive to have Otherwise, electricity supply due to the civil war, uh, it collapsed to the public electricity supply. Then you can have a private chainset at home, uh, which is uh, expensive to get new diesel and very dangerous to get new diesel fuel because it might be very dangerous to be on, on the streets for specific times in specific parts of the year when there is, again, a kind of a really wartime crisis. However, if you have once your photovoltaic and battery system, you put it on top of your roof and then you have uh, continued electricity supply or at least for many hours over the day, sunshine is, every, uh, is, is regularly available and then people can supply themselves. So this is the flexibility and modularity of the technology that it's a perfect solution for for very well developed rich countries in the world, but also for the very poor. Everything in between is nicely and that works also in a modular way. However, it has to be financed. So this, this, this bottleneck of financing of the upfront investment cost is still there. And that may, may, may slow down uh, the transition. And due to that, it's important to go for a de-risking. So first of all, technology is available, that there is less risk. Uh, for in, in the market to, to have it in, in, in low financing costs and, and then having simply financial means available. In the more developed world, it means financial means are always available if there is a positive business case. And for a positive business case, we need the right regulation, we need the right rules in the market, and we need de-risking rules because then the cost of capital is low. And just to have in mind, if you calculate levelized cost of electricity with a 7% cost of capital, which is maybe not that high, 50% of your, of your unit cost of electricity is just to, 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 to pay the interest uh, for the investment. So if you get the 7% down to 5%, your technical solution is the same, but your economic cost is minus 15%. And this tells us the impact of de-risking. So the less risk we have in the market, in the system, for the less uh, interest rates we get it financed. And, for, and as a consequence, we get a faster transition due to higher economic uh, attractiveness. And this fundamental rule works all over the world. So de-risking uh, is, is, is key. And that means remove all market economic risks uh, for those investing in these technologies. It's, it's not only solar. It's the same for batteries, for all other applications. Like so, vehicles, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah vehicles is... is yeah. Uh, is is of course the, the the same. So in the end, as less risk as possible, and for that we have to remove market risks. The, the, the technological risk is typically low. We know the technologies; they work, and they can be covered with insurance. Um, so that's typically not a problem. But the market risk uh, can be a problem. And for the case of Africa, really access to capital. I think there with with development banks and and other solutions. It has to be brought in the right direction. In the end, stable economic development is the best de-risking method. So if there is a regular economic growth in, in, in such emerging countries, developing countries of 5 to 10% a year, maybe that's the best environment to find a lot of stable business cases and then funding is typically available. Mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome.
Well, I could talk an hour more <laughs> on these topics. It's so interesting. But I think we're going to cut it here. Thank you so much for spending your time and um, getting up early, Christian, to, to do this interview so we can talk with Yannick all the way down in, in New Zealand. And thank you so much for, for being here. Thanks, Lars, for having us. And great show. Keep it on. <laughs> Yeah, many thanks for the interview. It's a pleasure to be in exchange uh, with you. Hopefully we can do do this another time when we get a little bit more. Maybe maybe when we get to 50% renewable, we know, okay, we have 10 years now until we, we hit the 100%. <laughs> we, we can do it earlier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. Perfect. Thank you very much. Take have care. Good day. Bye. Bye. It's a pleasure. See you. Bye.